name is Silo Carroll. I'm the editor-in-chief of the Jewish Telegraphic Agency, which is the 101-year-old Jewish syndication news service serving uh, English-speaking newspapers around the world. It's my pleasure to be here, um, and uh, I want to thank our organizers at EVO and all the other co-sponsors for um, a great day of talks and insight and uh, helping put together this panel. Um, I can't imagine, or maybe I can, when the organizers first picked this as a topic for a year-long dialogue, year-plus long dialogue series, that there would be so much relevance in the news. Um, I know in my business we have been covering Polish-Jewish relations. It's become a beat, really. Um, we have European reporter, and uh, it almost seems like on a, on a monthly and an almost weekly basis that there's a story about either tensions or the opposite positive developments in the relationship. So I want to just quickly introduce my panelists and then we're going to have a conversation, I think. I, we're, not going to, um, uh, we're not going to structure it uh, you know, with a series of presentations, but we'll keep it freewheeling. And uh, if we have an opportunity at the end, um, we'll open it for a few questions if we can. So um, I want to just start with some quick introductions and I'll go from the far side of the panel towards me. Uh, Molly Crab Crabapple is an artist and writer in New York, and she's the author of two, um, do we call them graphic novels or graphic memoirs? Uh, just, just, regular books. just regular books, Drawing Blood and Brothers of the Gun, and she is currently the Spring 2019 Artist in Residence at NYU's Kevorkian Center for Near Eastern Studies. Uh, next to her is uh, Dr. Michael Steinloff, he's the author of um, he's uh, the author of Bondage to the Dead, Poland, and the Memory of the Holocaust. That was in 1997. And um, he was, uh, uh, and he examined the history, the experience of witnessing the Holocaust and how it shaped Polish history and consciousness in the half century after World War II. Next to Michael is Anna Vicont, who is a journalist uh, for the, I'm going to say Warsaw Gazette, but what's, you can help me with the, you know, with the Polish print. The, the uh, Polish presentation, uh, pr uh, pronunciation. Uh, she's best known here, and I think around the world, in 2015 as the author of The Crime and the Silence, Confronting the Massacre of the Jews in Wartime in Bavna, um, which was published by Farrah Strauss Jarreau and was selected as one of the 100 Notable Books of the Year by the New York Times. And immediately to my left is Stanislaw Kajewski, as professor at the Institute of Philosophy at the University of Warsaw. And he is really uh, best known as among the founders of the Polish-Israeli Friendship Society, the Polish Council of Christian Jews, and really at the center of Poland's current Jewish community. So we're um, pleased to have you all on this panel. Thanks for taking part. Uh, Molly, I want to start with you because we're talking about current events, we're talking about Polish-Jewish relations, and you kind of burst onto the scene of this field a few weeks ago when you covered a rally uh, in the great new medium of Twitter um, in New York. Can you tell us what you saw, describe that for us, and, and, uh, and maybe and later we'll get to some of the reactions. Thank you so much. First off, I want to say that I feel so lucky and so grateful to be uh, at an event and on a panel of such scholars. Uh, I'm a journalist, but I am not a scholar of Polish-Jewish relations. And I actually came to be here because an anti-fascist group tipped me off about an event that happened uh, some weeks ago in front of City Hall in, in New York. Some weeks ago, um, a group of uh, Polish Americans, some of them uh, Polish nationalists, uh, decided to do a rally against um, the bill uh, S-47, or S-477, which is a bill uh, seeking to create a group to look at how 47 nations are giving reparations to Holocaust survivors that has no enforcement mechanism. It seems non-offensive, but um, <clears throat> to these Polish Americans, they had a rally of hundreds of people, uh, most of which was just uh, flag waving and whatnot, but some of which was holding incredibly anti-Semitic signs that accused Jews of welcoming the German invasion of Poland and uh, said things like, stop the Holocaust industry. At the protest, uh, where, which I mostly observed from the side of you know, these few dozen uh, mostly Jewish anti-fascists, the, the Polish ralliers uh, waved dollar bills at us, uh, screamed at us about the Holocaust industry. Uh, one man um, 
looked into my eyes and told me that, oh, I love Jews, but you know, 90% of the secret police, the Soviet secret police are Jewish. Another woman uh, told me in a very you know, nice tone that uh, they had tried to save the Jews of Warsaw, but the, Pol but the Jewish police were just too strong. Uh, I was given a flyer that contained wild misrepresentations of writers who I love, like Bernard Goldstein and Herman, Kru and Herman Kruk, saying that they blamed uh, Jews for their own deaths. It was a very disturbing, a very disturbing rally. And the thing, several things struck me, but one was the sense of a people's victimhood calcified into a shield to prevent self-critique and self-awareness. The Poles obviously suffered hideously under the Nazi occupation. And um, the Polish resistance is something to be honored, and that's something that I said a lot at the protest. I repeatedly expressed my admiration for the Home Army and Jankarski. However, in Poland now, and under the right-wing Polish government, this isn't enough. It's not enough to look at their history the way any country looks at their history, something that's made up of good individuals and bad individuals, things to honor and things to feel ashamed of. Any criticism seemed to be viewed as an attack and a denial of what Poles had suffered. So it was a very disturbing experience. Um, <laughs> that's not my signal, that was somebody else. <laughs> Shut up, Molly. So I, I want to get back to that, but Michael, I see you nodding your head. I mean, you nodded your head when, uh, when Molly mentioned victimhood, and uh, I think it, it, I, I feel she wanted to jump in, so go ahead. <laughs> Any, anyone here can jump in at victimhood, you know? <laughs> but, um, look, um, when, I, when my book came out about 20, what is it, 20, 25 years, what is it, 1987, 20 years ago, um, I ended it in the hope that as Poland was transitioning into becoming a part of Europe, uh, that this kind of stuff, which, was, which, which, which there was plenty of, you know, before 97, of course, uh, was going to be a thing of the past, and that uh, they become a normal, quote unquote, um, you know, a uh, country, member of the European Union, um, you know, a modern, uh, a progressive of some kind, uh, liberal, or at least country. And, uh, and yet, and yet, always there was this sense, how could a place that experienced the death of millions before their eyes um, um, not you know, have lasting effects um, on them? And uh, so what's happening today, I, you know, I see as a, you know, as, as a kind of a, a, a return of the repressed in a certain way, right? Uh, uh, they can't, it's impossible, you know, and, and with, with full pity, with full Rachmunas, and, and, you know, which is what she was saying, you know, I feel for people, you know? I mean, this is something that drives you crazy. I mean, you know, how can it not? Um, uh, you know, and then it inspires a whole, uh, you know, defensive thing. And uh, the one thing I have to, just, uh, just one more comment about, about my book, which, 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 in which I advance a concept that a lot of people love uh, of uh, trauma of the witnesses. That the witnesses of the Holocaust, especially the Poles, were traumatized by it, and that explains a lot of what happened after the war, and the violence and stuff. And uh, especially in my conversations with, uh, you know, which, 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 should get published there, with Ella Yanitska, uh, I've been convinced that things are not that, uh, not that clear at all, and that, in fact, uh, this, this notion of the, of the, of the, of the witness perpetrator, um, this, this complicated gray area, is what um, applies now. And so, therefore, all this sweeps into the present, and, um, and you know, creates some of the things we've been we've been seeing. I once thought that the that the uh, that Polonia, you know, American Polonia, was kind of a thing of the past, and they're going to swing on to uh, solidarity. And I was wrong. Explain and here they are strong. Just for people who don't know, just explain what that is. Polonia. Uh, Polonia is, is the Polish American uh, community. 
which was you know typically um, you know just like American Zionists used to be uh, more kind of you know um, um, conservative you know and, and uh, in terms of, of Polonia in terms of Poles uh, defending Poles against Jews and all this um, but that seemed to be a thing of the past and now they're 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 stronger than ever and of course this is all part of a we'll talk about this it's all part of a, a world so I want to ask, so Anna, I want to ask you, um, we're talking now about Mer I know, Poles, I guess the Polish diaspora. So now I'm asking you about, in, in Poland itself, what are the forces that are, that are contributing to kind of, I mean, they're happening all over Europe, rise of nationalism, ethno-nationalism. Um, what's unique about it in Poland, and especially as it relates to Jews in history?
and to and then all those okay. elements also on about history about you know memory that are not that do not fit that need are you know seen with suspicion so for example you know there are many examples given by Irena Grzyska Gross and you know it was it's very important which she went up to, to the very <coughs> present moment. For example, all those accursed soldiers or doomed soldiers, whatever, those partisans who were fighting communists right after the war, now are seen as the role models for young people very widely in Poland and also this is supported by the present government in many ways. And you know, what did those guys did, did do it uh, right after the war? They were fighting communists. So now, in what, what sense can they be role models now? Of course, it's good to heroism is perhaps good, and certainly it's, there is no nothing bad in you know uh, celebrating heroic fight for noble noble cause. But what is this cause now? What is what is the you know what is the parallel now? They what are the enemies? Because they, one of the slogans the young people are using in Poland is death to the enemies of the nation. They're really talking about death. Of course, it's symbolic. It's words. It's not acts. But and how do you words who the lead to acts. Who, 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 well, who do they mean? Who is who, the enemy? Who, the who is the enemy? So this is the question. So the enemy, when you really look at it, the enemy is liberals, liberalism. You know, all those changes, or, or those who have created the changes in our society, civilization that are very, you know difficult for all of us to understand that we don't know where we, we are going. All those changes that are, you know, say perhaps um, symbolized by, by the European Union for those people in Poland or by the term, term like LGBT, all those things, all those as elements are the enemy or the enemy that should be fought. And what is the best representation of that enemy today? Or who is the best representation? So symbol, who sim can symbolize the enemy? This threat of liberalism, you know, of the moral changes, of the, of the lack of traditional uh, role, and divisions, etc. Well, you, you've guessed it. Jews are the best, uh, the best symbols. And when you want to personify more with a more personal way, in Poland it would be Adam Michnik, who is the, the symbol of that, and the worldwide it would be George Soros. And they, as Jews, they represent all those threats. So in all those things are part of the background that really are present in Poland, but in Poland I think nobody would use such, almost nobody, I mean only the very extreme elements would use the language that you were mentioning, were, were, was used here uh, some time ago. Because apparently, you know, the, there are more, those more rigid, more extreme attitudes are better preserved, I don't know, in America than they are in Poland, where everything is somehow less rigid, I would say. I, I think that's common with many, many diaspora communities. That's maybe the case, yes. yes. I, I just wanted to, one, cent, one thing to remind people that the only place in the world, most recently, where Jews have been killed, is here. Okay, let's just, let's just, we were talking about metaphor. Yeah, also in Israel, also in Israel. Also in Israel. Okay. 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 Yes. In Israel. Yes. True, true. Well, all right. Well, so, did I, can I, okay, you were done. So I have a question about, I think this is, another flashpoint recently was, um, at the time he was Israel's acting foreign minister, Israel Katz, quoting Yitzhak Shamir, the famous line, Poles imbibe, anti-Semitism with their mother's milk. Mm -hmm. So we're talking now about historical guilt, historic um, victimhood. To what degree is anti-Semitism not just about politics and symbolism, but, but a part of Polish, ide <coughs> Polish Christian identity? Is it, should it be, um, or is it, is it a historical aberration? So first of all, first of, all of all Israel cuts, you know, no, it was so, so, I mean, it was so unfortunate. In Poland, well, just recently, it was reported that, you know, one of the uh, sur uh, survivors who 
for, from Israel, uh, who was, uh, survived the Holocaust and is in Israel, and took part in the March of the Living just recently, he called Israel cuts because of her, his remarks a stupid idiot. And this is something, of course, that is very, uh, you know, uh, received in Poland with great, great satisfaction. My good friend in Israel says that Israel cuts, you know, uh, not the wisest of politicians, because he was, in, during the first days in office, he was able to offend and somehow push away many of Israel's allies. So, so perhaps using him as, as a starting point to show the best idea. But and, and also I would note that uh, Yitzhak Shamir, before he was prime minister, was a member of Lehi, which was the most violent, fascistic um, <laughs> militia. But, uh, <laughs> and, and just to complicate things, let me add, yes. That his family was murdered by Poles. Yes. Okay. Shamir's yes. so, family. Yeah, Shamir's family. Yeah. Okay, and he knew of this, and and uh, uh, the best. And he apologized, by the way, for the remark, just for more context. He did apologize. The, the best. Uh, I, 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 again, I'm going to quote Eli and Yitzchak, who, who says, "No, Poles don't suck anti-Semitism with their mother's milk, but five minutes after they're born, they suck it. They get it out of the air." Now, now that's 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 oh, that that for me that's um, a trans you know it helps me change a lot of the ways I thought because I was still on this arc uh, of of 60s solidarity uh, you know New Poland and it turns out that's not simply the way it is and and I think that Poland uh, may be much more. Uh, solidly and, and uh, profoundly uh, an anti-Semitic country than I ever thought before. But excuse me, when you say that, you know, or she said that it's five minutes after we were birth, you know, you get well, it's from the atmosphere. No, no, but it still it says something very similar after all. Yes. That it's, uh, so the point is whether this is correct or not. So I think that is certainly generalizing, overly generalizing the issue and that's because um, of course there is a lot of anti-Semitism in the atmosphere but let us let me just stress very strongly that there is a lot of opposition to anti-Semitism in Poland as well and this is to me at least at least as important as anti-Semitism in the Polish atmosphere so there, are, there is a, this division that there are the, to put it simply an ugly face and a beauty face of, face of Poland they, they both exist Coexist and just to concentrate on the only one of them is simply wrong. I think. So I, I, wasn't, I wasn't so much concentrating as, 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 as I was like defending, defending my, my, you know, you know, my once belief that that, that that this was all. It's not all. That's all. You're absolutely right. So Anna, I want to get you. Now, I have a question. You're a journalist. Um, a lot of what obviously we know in the West is going to come from journalism. Is going to come from newspapers and, and radio and. and and I guess I want to ask this maybe in the context of, now we're talking about stereotypes and generalizations, um, maybe what is, the, what is the, the, the picture that we in the West get of Poland, um, what do they get right and what do they get wrong? If that's, if that's a way to, I mean, what, or what should we know <laughs> sitting here in the United States about Polish nationalism, Polish relationship with its, with, with its Jewish community, Polish relationship to the, you know, the symbol of the Jew? Mm -hmm. um, um, poly, Polish relation with Jewish com community, uh, this I don't, I don't know, maybe Stasek, I'm not so. Um, I am, my point of interest is the relation between Jews and those who perished in the Soviet. So, so, so in other words, you're saying the, you need an other 
shirt tonight for you to identify yourself as a nationality, and that other is the ultimate other is the Jew. I mean, there was a moment, you know, when there were two interpretations of Polish nationalism. Okay, there was because the, the, the socialists also had uh, under Pilsudski at the beginning had some notion that harked back to the old, uh, you know, multinational uh, uh, Poland that existed for for, for centuries, uh, you know, in, in feudal times. But once uh, modern times, and for Poland that meant the 1890s, you had a kind of a socialist heart that, you know, maybe we can, you know, have a multinational, but that didn't work too much in, in the modern world. And, and what became uh, strongest is this, uh, is the party that is the direct antecedent of, of, uh, of, to, of today's government. You know? and, and, and to speak more broadly, what, what you're saying is very true, and it's a failure not, not just of um, the Polish conception of ethno-nationalism, but of all conceptions of ethno-nationalism. It's impossible to have an ethnically based state that isn't um, also based fundamentally on excluding an other. And one of the things that to me is so dangerous and so worrying about our time is that this very 19th century European ethno-nationalism, the same ethno-nationalism as Poland for the Poles, Serbia for the Serbs, you know, Greece for the Greeks, it's something that's coming back, and it's something that's resurgent all over the world, not just in Europe, and it's incredibly dangerous. Yeah, I agree. Of course, I think that nationalism or ethno-nationalism does need uh, to exclude. The question is whether in Poland it has to ex exclude the Jews rather than anyone else. I'm not sure, I must say, because I think that the image is more complex. So first of, first of all, this very simplified, you know, image of the, this bad enemy, 100% evil, is not applied to the Jews now. It is rather applied to Muslims. Muslims and the possible Muslim immig immigrants who don't exist in Poland, they, in po I think they represent, when you see, they represent the terrorists, the evil, you know, they are 100% bad, bad guys. These are Muslims, although this is complete abstraction. And also, so, there's wow, a old Muslim community in Poland. There is, say that again, I'm sorry? There's a very old Muslim community in Poland as right, well. But, but, but Poland hasn't seen the kind of immigration, the kind of migration that other... Uh, there's almost no, no, no very little, it's, it's incomparable. But, no, but, let me, let, but let me talk about the Jews. So, with the Jews, I think it's a bit different. I think there is a very interesting phenomenon that in Poland today, uh, even the most, uh, say, nationalistic right-wing uh, politicians or leaders, except for the extreme extremists, but except for the extremists, the others, they really would like to have Jews as allies. Not Jews as the enemies or the symbolic, Jews as allies. They want to be pro-Israel, they want to have Jews on their side, and they have done, you know, moves in this direction. To because Jews go back to the Because besides... <laughs> what, are, what are the motivations? <laughs> Another matter. But this is, the fact is that there are very few people who are anti-Semitic and proud of it. Before World War II, it was common to be a proud, somewhat to be anti-Semitic and proud of being anti-Semitic. Not anymore. Well, after the war, it stopped. And now, in, there are anti-Semitic, I think, stronger and stronger in Poland. But the idea that the Jews could be our allies, that we can fight, I don't know, Muslims together with Israel, liberalism together with conservative Jews, you know, European Union together with all those who are for the traditional values, uh, and uh, be with the Trump uh, administration, uh, you know, to, to, to defend uh, whatever, the traditional, whatever it is. And this is a very clear motivation or mentality which is present both among the politicians in Poland and all including those in the ruling party and in fact they also there are such people in the church who are who see the Jews as the as the possible allies or as allies so it's much more complex well, of course you would say that this is a this can be also called anti-semitic because it's using Jews in an instrumental way absolutely true but the fact is that Jews are used in an instrumental way by almost everyone, you know. I, 
because you know Jews can be used um, in, in very various roles, and it is being done and it has been done in uh, everywhere. Would that suggest that the driving, you know, that the overall driving force of a lot of this is, is less anti-Semitism than, than this, uh, you know, ethno-nationalist uh, movement that will bring, for example, um, uh, you know, um, uh, um, Israel uh, close to Hungary, for example, right? And, and support, you know, where, where, where the demonization of George Soros, I mean, you can't imagine a more, a more you know, anti-Semitic trope. Uh, and yet, and yet, we have, you know, our president, of course, uh, uh, involved with, and so with all this, and, and um, it just, it seems that the, 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 the underneath it all, I mean, what you're saying is, is correct, you know, that, that what's singly important here, you know, is, is this uh, return of this ethno-nationalist um, and this movement. Um, when I was, you know, when I was young, when I was really young, uh, you know, it was all a movement towards progress, towards freedom, towards, uh, uh, you know, letting go, and towards uh, liberalism, I guess you'd call it liberalism, we called it radicalism back then. But now, you know, it's of course, it's turned around. It's turned around and it's moving um, in the directions of, uh, of unfreedom. And that's, uh, and that I think, and that catches up um, whatever anti-Semitism, whatever Polish-Jewish antagonisms, they're all in there, you know? They're all, I think, uh, a piece of this, so. And it also still um, divides Jews into good Jews and bad Jews. There's good Jews that you can work with, as you said, like working with Israel to fight Muslims or working with you know, conservative Jews to fight LGBT people. But then there's the specter of the bad Jew, right? Who is the George Soros liberal Jew who is feminizing the nation and corrupting it and bringing in people of color and bringing in Muslims. And that specific conspiracy theory is what caused the murders in Pittsburgh and in San Diego. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. Mm -hmm. let, let me ask about, uh, because even as we're talking about this, these trends, anti-Semitic trends, I mean, we've also reported on over the years this tremendous cultural revival, in a sense. And now, sometimes it's dismissed as um, Jew, you know, uh, you know, philo-Semitism without the Jews. Uh, on the other hand, we talk about, I know you're, you're actively involved in the community there, I know that the JCC in Krakow uh, boasts of a, of a very vibrant community. What's the reality for Jews in Poland? Um, is the future bright? Is it, um, you know, it, it, or, or not? Well, of course, nobody knows, but the fact is that for the past 30 years we've been developing, and when I think about what I could imagine in the 1980s, it's been a miracle, the development, the revival and everything, although it's very modest, you know, by New York standards, it's almost non-existent, but by Polish standards of 1985, it's really uh, a, miracles, a miraculous development. Still, you know, in the past few years, things are getting more tense, and, uh, and for the first time, I think, in the past 30 years, there, among Jews, also young Jews, uh, there is a, a visible fear, or uh, the beginning of a, of a sentiment that perhaps, you know, we don't know what would happen, so it, what will happen, so, you know, what is this moment when one should really know that this is the time to leave? Something that 10 or even 5 years ago nobody would really talk about, now is beginning to appear or to reappear, if you want. So in this sense, it's a rather, you know, well, you know, problematic uh, atmosphere, despite all the developments and all the, you know, institutional presence, etc. And despite the fact that, that formally speaking, the relations with the government, with the Polish institutions, state institutions are good. And, you know, there is clearly, you know, everybody recognizes that space and place for Jews in Poland, but the atmosphere is, is getting worse, clearly. I can say as a Polish Jew, uh, um, I am not in any community of Jews, I am a Jew by my, my, myself, and it's a rather difficult experience to be a Jew in Poland. Because you have, if you are a Jew, you have to be polite, you know, because there are we Jews and the Poles, and you have to be polite to be accepted. 
people like France, in Jewish France, in, 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 you know, in, in such situation mm -hmm. that the need to, you know, my, my grandmother was assimilated. So I don't think that I have to repeat in each generation the same, uh, the same road, the same narrow path to the assimilation. I am a poor and I am a Jew. But I have still to say, yes, yes, I am a poor. I, yes, I own up the righteous. Yes, 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 the murders of the Jews were accidentally, <coughs> but the righteous. And I don't, I don't want to do this. And it's a, and it's a problem in Poland. Just to, to, just to give some uh, just context for anyone in the audience who doesn't know, your book on Yavadna came out. Um, and I think I imagine, and in which you confirmed what Jan Gross had written about, that this was a, was a neighbors killing neighbors. Um, it wasn't a, it wasn't carried out at the instructions or with the complicity of the Nazis. It was a homegrown grassroots pogrom. Um, and your research just strengthened what had been, he'd been attacked for saying that. So just tell us a little about the reaction that you got and how, and how difficult it was for you. No, this time it was because the book of Young Cross Neighbors, after this book, started a very huge, open, incredibly open discussion in Poland. It was uh, like a miracle. And uh, it was the most important discussion after 1989 when we became a, became a free country. So my book appeared four years after Cross's book. And it was the best time in Poland. So I came to friends of mine, very uh, tall, high, uh, and uh, solid. They came with me as my my bodyguards because they were afraid what hap what would happen with me. And in all the meetings, there were a lot of people, and these people were so so incredibly kind. It was the, like a, a Polish sociologist. Irenaeusz Krzemiński found in his researches a new category in Poland that didn't appear before in his researches, the category of anti-antisemites. <laughs> the people who realized that, and it was 10% in this time, that they realized the level of antisemitism in Poland, but before they didn't realize that they simply thought that it was natural that the grandmother told that you were kidnapped by a Jew if you don't, didn't behave. And, uh, and they started to, you know, to pay the way to the Jewish cemetery, to be interested in the classical music, different things like this. We're talking about what time period? It, n two, 204. And it was the people who came to my, uh, to my book event. So the reception was very, very, very good. And because of this, I am, I am as old as you, as for, I think, maybe. So we thought of, we, for us, the idea of progress was obvious, no? But the world is progress, no? So in my, for my generation, that was obvious. So I thought that we done it. We done it. You know, it's incredible, but we Well, it was, it, it, was, it was the post-war narrative. It was, it was yes, the post-war uh, international. Not the mainstream. Right. And uh, 
and now it changed. Now I think that it's how the men can be born. Well, they, are, they feel, they feel the encouraged. They feel, they feel, yes. Also, for example, Father Rizik, you know, the, who is the head, the priest who is the head of the Catholic radio and the whole media empire. And, you know, like in the 90s, he seemed to be a marginal figure. Precisely. In, and then he became more and more str stronger and stronger and more and more influential. And now... What was his name again? I'm sorry. His name is Father Tadeusz Rydzyk, who is... Uh, you know, and the radio is called the Radio Maria. It's a, it's a symbolic term in the name of Poland. It's everybody in Poland knows it. And now he is like the, the dominant trend, the dominant, um, you know, uh, force in the Polish Catholic Church, which is really... A, was so surprising to us that this is developed in that, that direction. But to continue what I just said before, he is also one of those who, you know, some time ago was promoting anti-Semitism on the radio very strongly. And, you know, things similar to the, what, the, what you heard here during the rally. And, but in the recent years, this anti-Semitism was clearly toned down and he started to have some contacts with the Jews that wanted to have contact with him. He also, there was a set a meeting with the Israeli ambassador, and he has a whole <coughs> museum being built and a shrine for the righteous among the nations, and he tries, and people working for him try to show that the Polish church uh, was doing nothing but rescuing Jews, and, you know, but he tries to do those things to really have Jews on his side. That's, that's another example of the same phenomenon. Rather than express anti-Semitism, he uses, of course, Jews or the symbolic Jews or imagined Jews for his own purposes, but he tries to do that, which, after all, however problematic it is, it's better to have that, this than, you know, uh, ex, you know just uh, simple anti-Semitism. Right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, think, I, think, oh, I think you... One of the things um, that occurred to me um, that was interesting for me uh, was the reaction that I got after reporting on that rally. I, I'm someone who has covered a lot of controversial issues. I've covered Palestine, I've covered Syria, I've covered Turkey, I've covered you know American immigration. Many issues that get people angry. And I have never experienced anything like what I have from Polish nationalists, never. Um, I, I thought I was a complete connoisseur of trolls, apparently I'm not. But the thing that was so interesting to me was there was a real naivete about it that was very different than if I was getting harassed by, say, the American alt-right. The American alt-right would try to conceal their identities because uh, they would realize that even if they personally were racist, there might be some repercussion for them. Whereas you had these Polish people living in New York City saying the most horrifically anti-Semitic things to me, uh, mocking Jewish children being sent on boxcars using their real names and their real photos that went to their real LinkedIn's where they're trying to get jobs as TV cameramen. Uh, there was no sense that, not even that this was bad, but there was no sense that like this might come back to bite me. And today, I'm sure many of you have noticed, there was someone going around giving a single spaced double-sided piece of paper demanding that Jews acknowledge, I don't know, some imaginary crimes we did against Poles during the Holocaust, and it contained a little denunciation of me. One of the most um, disturbing um, things, as I, you know, as, as, that I've noted, is um, 20 years ago, Rizik, Father Rizik and Radio Maria, uh, I mentioned them, you know, what I, in, in, in my book, and then I added, you know, who is following them? Well, by and large, people on fixed incomes who can't uh, uh, deal with this new Poland of progress, et cetera, et cetera. And it never occurred to me that young people would be attracted to this. And, uh, and it turns out they are. And this is, for me, a real enigma. I, you know, I would like, like to hear some you know, some, people, some more commentary on this. Yeah, I was going to ask some question about generationally. I mean, what changes? You I mean, think? the generation, this was supposed to be a generation right. schooled um, for the European community. And suddenly, they're not, you know. Father Rizik has a college which, in which students study for the European, uh, to, to be, you know, employed by the European institutions. He's, you know, very skillful in being part of it, although, when Poland was supposed to join the European Union, he was, uh, you know, uh, making the whole big uh, case 
against you. But now, now, now he's like able to work with it. And he's in also a very influential politician. German uh, Nazi Germany that was occupying Poland. 
it's important, I think, to say that. Now, uh, I think that the museum does a very good job and has been doing it for, I mean, the museum Auschwitz. We call it the museum for, uh, for, the, lack, for the lack of a better term, but it's, the museum is the, the same place, but we call it the museum Auschwitz. And the has, 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 has been doing a very good job. In addition, let me just also remind you that that should have been, should be very clear from the previous discussion um, before our panel that Poland is now the most important place for the Holocaust research. And this is very important. And also Anya's book, Anya Beacon's book, as part of this very important process of discovering, uh, explaining, you know, um, all those uh, facts and uh, the deeper realities behind the facts. And so this is really available. So you are saying that young people don't know, but they can learn if they only want to read. And this is, everything is now available, much more so in Poland than in some other countries, you know, in our part of, the, of Europe, by the way. So in this sense, you know, things have gone, you know, in a good direction, in very, very far. The fact is that we are, the situation is getting worse, and of course the official teaching is not encouraging that, that uh, scholarly knowledge, rather the opposite. There is this whole lab, very important uh, for the ruling, for the government, very important process of what they call uh, implementing historical policy, which is supposedly, you know, the policy to show how good innocent and innocent Poland was to the, Jew, to the Jews, how good to the Jews, how, how innocent, etc. So, of course, this is a very big problem, and I, I don't know what exactly what is being taught in schools, but I'm afraid that this has, this is, I, I don't know if you know, but uh, I, I'm afraid that this is much getting worse than it used to be, but the material, the knowledge, the, you know, the, the, the resources are, are here, are there, so I think they can be used any time when only the, the right suggestions are formulated on the government level, and this can happen if not this year, then sometime in the future. So, thank you for that. Um, we, have a, we have time just for a few questions from the audience. I don't know if someone's going around with Mike. Um, so, why don't we do the same thing we did in the previous session, which is I think we can take about three questions. Um, we'll see how that goes. And then we'll open it up to our panelists. Um, I'll do the usual warning. Can we make these questions and not speeches? Okay. So, do you want to, um, this gentleman right here, uh, the woman, yeah. So, then we'll. Okay. Thank you, panel. Uh, just a question. I, I read so much about that law, uh, you know, that, that governs semantics, how we talk about the Holocaust. And um, uh, I was in Israel when, when the, the whole thing with Netanyahu came out in the papers. But um, you always hear, you know, that the, that, you know, the law basically says that Poland was not complicit in the Holocaust, and that you're not allowed to say that the Polish state or Polish nation uh, was complicit in the Holocaust. Does that, I, I, it's never clear in any of the articles you read, in terms of inside Poland itself, would that preclude a statement or a teaching in schools that says that there were individual Polish people that collaborated during the Holocaust? I just wanted to say that this country is no different. About 10 years ago, the Times published, they went around and interviewed high school students, and one girl said, when she was asked what the Holocaust was, she thought it was a Jewish holiday. And let's not forget, centuries ago, all these Polish princes in Lithuania, they invited the Jews to go there to boost up their economy, because you know they're so smart to with the money. And uh, the gentleman over here has, has his hand up right there. And we'll, then we'll take those three. <coughs> All right, a question is from Molly. Molly, actually, I was at the protest too. And I saw what really happened. Okay, and what happened was the, uh, basically the Jewish members of Antifa basically screamed at the Poles, well, what is it, immigrants, remember? Yeah, I do. Immigrant, what? What, what, what did they scream? Question. 
Immigrants, right? I believe Paul it is Curry fascists go home. No, no, that's fascists not what they say. That's not what they say. All right, so let's not, let's not have this debate here. It's not the right thing for you. If you have a question, we can do it, but otherwise, we'll get on and open to somebody else. I organized this rally. Right. That's not what happened. She's just you know, not okay. So we can discuss that. Another, okay, I, I, we can't litigate that here. So why don't I take the uh, What they were screaming and is and Polish and are immigrants, Nazis are not, and that instigated the whole thing. Okay, right. okay. that is true. Okay, thank you. Has no right. Was there? Well, okay, okay, thank you. I've got 50 people that can say the same exact thing. Mom. Okay, thank you. So let's just ask the. Look, so we do have one question in there. That was good for. Uh, um, so the question is, the, how does the, 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 the law against um, talking about Polish publicity in the Holocaust, how does that apply within Poland itself? Well, basically in Poland, um, you know, the government really probably didn't want to, re to stop research or to, you know, to stop talking about individuals or more than individuals who are you know, involved in that. That's, but I think that they tried to defend Poland from you know generalized generalized uh, accusations. But the fact that they formulated the law in a way that was very very problematic because it could be used, it could possibly be used to just criminalize anyone who could say, for example, my father was a survivor. Is a survivor, and he was talking to. He was always telling us that he was afraid of the Poles. This is a standard statement. So if you read the law in a, in a, you know, in the, this special way, to that you go, you could say that this is something that could be uh, that should be prosecuted. That's the state. So in th that's why this law was so bad. But the motivations, I think, perhaps were not that bad because they wanted to. They, you know, they, they feel that, the, you know, that there is this danger of seeing Poland as the, the, you know, perpetrator, which was, would really be wrong, you know, which is wrong. And so I can understand the motivation, but the law itself was bad, so it's very good that there was this response and the reaction to the, the negative reaction to the law in the, in the world, which, of course, made the government to change the law. And I just want to ask one last question because I think we're good. I have a question. So, okay, go ahead. You're the last question, ma'am. Go for it. It's not a question of the cup. No, then it's not. We're not going to do that. So I have one last question, uh, which is, are there political forces today in Poland that offer um, a kind of a countervailing message to the current, for, you know, the current trends towards nationalism? And what are the chances and what are the prospects going forward for maybe a more liberal Poland, or just a different way of talking about these issues? There, there, there still seem to be two visions of, of a Poland, um, except I, I'm worried that, that, that their, their proportion is the same as, as it was over 100 years ago. In other words, there's a, uh, there's a left-wing vision which is inclusive, which sees Poland as a place of, of many nationalities and with a, with a past that, that all of us thought was pretty beautiful uh, back in the 80s, and, um, and then there it seems to be a much more powerful current of, of what we've been discussing. But there are beautiful, especially you know, in the urban centers, uh, there are beautiful people involved in this kind of struggle, you know, taking on the struggle. I mean, if, if we focus on the, on the, on the negative, uh, there's a lot of positive, but they're, they, they're, they're increasingly feeling embattled and encircled. But they're fighting the good fight, you know. They really are. They're amazing. Some of them are amazing people, you know, and people in small towns, you know, who have, who have decided to maintain Jewish memory, whatever that may mean. And uh, you know, they're in this struggle too. But uh, increasingly, uh, well, well, when you have the support of the government, especially, uh, they're feeling overwhelmed. But but they're on it. They're beautiful. Of course, that's what on the other side. That's what drew me to Poland. I mean, that's that's what kept me in Poland for all these decades. Magnificent people. Hmm. On that note, I think, I think, we'll, um, I think we're going to stop. I want to thank you all. all I think there's a small reception here. So there's a reception, and then also on the positive note, I want to invite you on Thursday this week.
uh, to Fordham at 6 p.m. for the screening of a really beautiful documentary, Bogdan's Journey. Uh, so it's at 6 p.m. there are flyers outside. I also was asked to announce that the coat check closes at 6, so grab your coats and join us for the reception. Thank you.